Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Laya Greeno, and I manage the Evaluation and Program Effectiveness Working Group at Interaction, which is the largest coalition of U.S.-based international NGOs with nearly 200 member organizations. This is the sixth webinar in a series of impact evaluation webinars that Interaction is developing with financial support from the Rockefeller Foundation and which are meant to accompany a four-part impact evaluation guidance note series. Um, today's webinar is the second webinar we're doing focused on mixed methods and it's meant to complement um, the September 6th webinar by Michael Bamberger in which he presented on his guidance note, Introduction to Mixed Methods and Impact Evaluation. We're very happy to have two Interaction members presenting today, Jeannie Anand, Director of Research and Evaluation at the International Rescue Committee, and Megan Gash, Research and Evaluation Specialist at Freedom from Hunger. Both Jeannie and Megan will be presenting on examples of mixed methods impact evaluations their organizations have conducted, and will also comment on why their organizations chose to use this approach, at least for, for these evaluations. So I'll begin our session today with a short background on this series, and then we'll be turning it over to Jeannie and Megan for their presentations. As with previous webinars, the slides and webinar recordings will be posted on Interaction's website afterwards. We'll take questions once the presentations have ended, um, and as you'll see, we've, we've extended the webinar slightly to make sure we have sufficient time for Q&A. Um, I'll then wrap things up briefly and let you know what's coming next. So as those who've joined us for these webinars before know, the purpose of this guidance note and webinar series is to increase organizations' understanding of and ability to conduct high-quality impact evaluation. Our aim isn't to tell organizations exactly what to do, but rather to provide them with sufficient information so that they can make better decisions around impact evaluation. The four notes in this series are Introduction to Impact Evaluation by Patricia Rogers, Professor in Public Sector Evaluation at RMIT University, Linking Monitoring and Evaluation to Impact Evaluation by Burt Perrin, an Independent Consultant, Introduction to Mixed Methods in Impact Evaluation by Michael Bamberger, and Uses of Impact Evaluation results by David Bonbright, Chief Executive of Keystone Accountability. And the, three, the first three guidance notes are now available. While the series is targeted at NGO staff in particular, the notes in the series of webinars will be useful to staff and other types of organizations as well, um, with the exception of the third guidance note on mixed methods, which is slightly longer and more technical than the rest. Each note is just 20 to 30 pages long, so they're really just meant as an introductory resource on these topics and are intended to raise the issues that those involved in impact evaluation should be thinking about to provide some practical guidance, and to point people to additional resources. So um, just a few comments on the, the webinars in the series so far. So each guidance note in the series is accompanied by two webinars, one more theoretical, the other more focused on actual practice. Uh, in March, we launched the first guidance note with a webinar in which Patricia Rogers presented an overview of her note, and we followed that with a webinar featuring presentations from Allison Davis of Oxfam America, who focused on, impact, on an impact evaluation of a program to prevent gender-based violence in El Salvador as well as from Mulu Chekel and Larry Dershem of Save the Children, who presented brief case studies of impact evaluations conducted in Palestine and Kazakhstan. In April, Bert Perrin presented an overview of the second note in the series, um, and Interaction members shared their experiences in the webinar that followed, with John Kurtz of Mercy Corps presenting on how the organization has used existing data from program M&E and secondary sources as part of recent impact evaluations, and Celeste Lemro of Africare presenting on how monitoring data influenced the direction of impact evaluations in Ghana and Niger. And finally, our last webinar, as I've already mentioned, was with Michael Bamberger, who gave an overview of the third note in the series. The notes, along with the recordings and presentations from the webinars, will be posted on Interaction's website as they're developed at the link you see at the bottom of your screen. As you can see, the first two guidance notes and materials from the four webinars we've had to actually the, the first three guidance notes and materials from the five webinars we've had to date have already been posted. And we've also posted questions to answers to questions we received from webinar participants from Patricia's and Bert's webinar. Um, 
also we the translations um, for the first guidance note are now available as well. Um, each guidance note is being translated into several languages, so we encourage you to share these with your staff and colleagues in the field. Just one more thing before I turn to our presenters. If you would like to minimize or maximize this webinar screen, just click on the orange arrow. You can view the presentation in full screen mode by clicking on the blue box below that. Uh, due to the large number of participants, you will remain on mute for the rest of the webinar, but if you have a question, please type it in this question box, and I'll be monitoring questions throughout the presentation, so feel free to send them to me as you think of them. So that's enough for me, um, and I'm going to turn it over to our presenters now, and first up is Jeannie Anand from the IRC. So Jeannie, I'm going to switch over to you now. Okay, thanks all. Thanks, Laya. Um, hopefully, you can all hear me. Uh, and and thanks all for joining. I look forward to to the discussion and, and questions at the end. Um, I'm going to present on uh, an evaluation that we are still in the midst of conducting here at IRC uh, on the impact of a family-based intervention in Burmese communities in Thailand. Um, we will, uh, this is a, an evaluation that we've been doing uh, at IRC um, together with a partner from, Teresa Betancourt from Harvard University, um, uh, our research coordinator and now research, evalu research evaluation coordinator in the field is Amanda Sim, and, and Eve Puffer was actually with us and is now a professor at, at Duke University, and so um, this is very much a shared work. Um, So in terms of a description of the overall project, and then I'll get to what, what piece of it we're evaluating through our impact evaluation, the overall goal of the project is to improve the safety and well-being and development of vulnerable girls and, and boys in Tak district uh, in, in Thailand. Um, the first outcome is that families and communities reduce child abuse, exploitation, and neglect. And the second outcome of the overall project is that children access basic services and are supported by a child protection response system. Um, you can see there the, the target is 20 communities in this, this area, and it's, this is a project funded by uh, DCOF at USAID. Um, the project has been running since 2010. Sorry, I can hear, just want to say, I can hear a little bit of typing in the background, so I don't know if someone's not on mute. Um, just wanted to um, say that, thanks. Um, and uh, is going to be finishing in July of next year. So this evaluation focuses on the first outcome, which is reducing child abuse and neglect in families and communities. And the first work, and this was actually done before the we put in the proposal, but was looking at, in order to achieve this outcome, what are the evidence-based approaches that we know um, have led to some uh, reduction in, in child abuse and neglect. And in uh, high and some middle-income countries, there's pretty strong evidence that family-based interventions um, can can actually have, have fairly strong effects and, and reduce child abuse and neglect in families, but also be a protective factor for um, uh, abuse and neglect within communities and schools. Um, so our, part of our work at IRC was to review that evidence and to narrow down the types of interventions that we wanted to try to implement and also uh, increase the evidence base in low-income countries where we work and also conflict-affected communities. So our hypotheses for the family-based intervention, the particular intervention around outcome, uh, outcome one, was that conducting doing an inter, uh, a family-based intervention uh, would help to increase positive parenting practices, uh, would decrease uh, the use of harsh forms of punishment, and would increase positive family functioning, which is, has been correlated with a lot of positive outcomes for children. In terms of secondary outcomes, that this would increase uh, children's psychosocial well-being, increase the resilience to other external factors, such as displacement and, and uh, conflict, and um, then decrease parental alcohol use, which was actually added after our qualitative work. Um, so most of these hypotheses were formed from some of the evidence and our own um, 
and the outcomes we were trying to achieve, but the, uh, the alcohol use was actually added uh, due to some of the, the qualitative work. So the overall evaluation design in terms of the mixed methods design uh, was first to conduct a, a literature review, and this was both of the, the, this was iterative in the sense that there was the overall literature review to look at what types of interventions we wanted to implement based on the evidence, but also then um, throughout based on what type of intervention we wanted to do specifically, and um, looking at some of the, the measurements we wanted to use, and I'll talk a, a little bit more about that. Uh, then we conducted qualitative research, and I'll focus uh, mostly here on in the red on this qualitative research and then how that informed the selection and cultural adaptation of a family intervention and, and measures. Um, and that's in large part because that's where we are in the um, process, or those are the findings that we have now. We then pilot tested the intervention um, and then uh, are conducting now a randomized waitlist controlled trial with 400 families in these 20 communities, uh, which includes a baseline survey, quantitative survey, a one mo month post intervention follow up survey, and then a six month follow up survey to look at maintenance of change. Um, along with the follow up surveys, the post intervention survey, we're also doing qualitative interviews of about 30 parents. And 30 children. And so this is um, both the sequential design, as you can see, with qualitative research informing our, our quantitative research, but also then um, quantitative and qualitative done at the, uh, at the same phase in, in the post-intervention uh, surveys or post-intervention uh, research. So the qualitative research design um, the, the purpose of it was really, the, this first piece was really to understand local definitions of uh, child and family well-being and to make sure that our measures um, and what we were trying to look at, well, both our measures and the intervention were informed by how people uh, in these communities perceived uh, children's well-being and, and family well-being. Um, to identify risk factors and protective processes, uh, again, as they're perceived in the, the families there, uh, from the families there, and to feed into the selection and adaptation of the family intervention and the measures. Um, our approach in the qualitative work was to have a, a lens, a family resilience lens, so not just looking for problems, but also looking for the protective factors and a, in a, a strength-based way, and also to think about children within a social ecology, so looking at individual, family, and other um, societal, both risk and protective factors. So this, the first qualitative work um, had used free listing uh, interviews, semi-structured interviews, and focus groups, and interviewed 10 community leaders, 53 female parents and, and caregivers, uh, 50 male uh, parents or caregivers, and 68 um, children. So this is a picture of um, the, the children's activities uh, were actually participatory in the focus group, so it encouraged discussion but used some drawings in order to ask questions about children's, what were, um, how did they define a child who was doing well, how did they de define a child who was not doing very well, and uh, to get at some of those characteristics, and as well, uh, here you can see um, Obviously, the, the translation up there was added, but a family that was doing well or was united, uh, which is one of, the way they, one, one of the ways that they talked about it, or a not united or a family that wasn't doing well, and how they uh, perceived and defined um, the individuals and families, children and families, as well as what were the factors that um, they thought influenced um, a family that was doing well or a child that was, was or was not doing well. So I won't, I'm not going to, given time, I'm not going to go into um, the findings, but I did want to at least flash some up here to give you a sense of, of uh, the findings. Um, so these were some of the protective processes that people discussed, both children and, and parents and caregivers discussed, um, that were protective for family well-being, so looking at um, individual family and, and environmental there, and then also some of the risk factors. Um, meta is a term that was used there that um, the translation we best understand to be loving kindness, um, and this actually came up uh, quite a bit that a family um, has loving kindness as one of its characteristics. Um, and that even when parents are disciplining children, that that's the, uh, a part of, of how they um, discipline. Um, in terms of protective processes for child well-being, um, again, you can see here some of the individual, family, and environmental protective processes that were named. 
um, but from innate characteristics, people saying some of it's just about how a child is and how a child is born, um, to how families um, guide or, or discipline, and then to um, broader environmental role modeling and, and religious practices, uh, which came out fairly strongly. Risk factors, um, this community has experienced um, certainly displacement, but a lot of uh, poverty and economic insecurity, um, family separation, um, and then also uh, parental stress. And then, as I mentioned, in, in terms of our additional hypotheses, alcohol use came up as, as a risk factor in families. Um, and then there are some of the environmental in terms of uh, what, you know one of the opposites being a negative community role model. Um, so in terms of how we use these qualitative findings, we uh, first use them to ap apply or, or to, we applied the findings for intervention selection. So we um, tried to look at what are the risk factors that came up in the qualitative work that you know, we think need to be targeted for reduction. And this was, you know, comparing that in to the, the evidence of other risk factors um, that have come up in other places and which are the protective processes that would um, we would want to target to help strengthen uh, in order to increase child and family resilience. We, we then chose a, a program called Strengthening Families program um, and look to culturally adapt the, the Strengthening Families program. And this included, um, you know, changing some of the stories and examples that are used, but also from the qualitative work, it came up um, that there was a need for you know some of the just logistics around holding meetings at night, um, and you know who to involve, how to involve community leaders, so that there was permission in a sense for people to um, to participate. So there were both. Uh, ways that we adapted the Strengthening Families program, um, but also logistical ways that we, we uh, adapted that all came from the qualitative work. Um, why we chose Strengthening Families program and how that was informed, uh, again, by the qualitative work first, um, there was the, it, it did have a substance abuse element to it. That's not the main focus uh, when you look at the sessions, but there there was this additional piece which fit with some of the, the findings from the qualitative work. Um, it's There is a strong evidence base, other research showing that in, in a number of different countries uh, it has been effective, including southern Thailand with uh, Thai communities, but um, that was certainly a positive for us in terms of adapting it and, and having it already been implemented in multiple countries, including Thailand. Thailand. Um, it, it's a behavioral change focused rather than, you know, some family-based models are more therapeutically focused, um, which didn't match what we were finding in the qualitative work, and, and very skills focused and um, family-based, as has been mentioned. Um, the application, which I, is, is more, I think, to this overall mixed methods uh, discussion, uh, to the quantitative work was that it helped us select and adapt our measures, our quantitative measures. So we defined from these questions about um, how, how would you describe or how do you define or what are the characteristics of a child who's doing well and a child who's not doing well um, and a, a family uh, who's doing well and not doing well. We were able to, to really understand um, how people define uh, child well-being and family well-being. And um, have that influence both how, both how we choose measures, create measures, and also uh, adapt measures. So then we went to a literature review of, of what measures um, would best fit this context, um, looking for those that had previously been used in a, um, in a similar population in Thailand or a similar context uh, that had good psychometric properties and also that had this good fit with the qualitative data, and then we um, pilot tested and did some cognitive interviewing um, to, to ensure that the quantitative measures worked. So to give you a sense of what that looked like, um, we found the, uh, measures on parent uh, discipline and behavior. Um, and this, these were measures that uh, we adopted from the Duke study because they uh, had been conducted and used in Thailand. and. Um, and, and we also felt they matched fairly well with what we were looking for uh, from the qualitative work. We did adapt some of these, um, although we tried to stick fairly closely to them by um, adapting phrasing or uh, some examples. So here an example is how many times did you ch uh, scare your child into behaving, uh, which was sort of the root question. For example, and this came from um, some of the qualitative work by saying, he or she will drown in a hot uh, oil pot. Um, 
And then some others like family functioning and child resilience, we actually created from the qualitative data. We didn't find measures that quite fit. And so um, some of the, the, there were additional questions that we actually created. Um, for example, people in my family have meta, have this loving kindness towards each other, or, or they speak softly and sweetly to each other using appropriate pronouns. Uh, there's a third person pronoun uh, that's important and seen as very polite for children to use. Um, again, child behavior, we used a subscale of the child behavior checklist um, and stuck fairly closely to this but did do some adaptation based on the qualitative work. So this was an audit is a, an alcohol use um, measure. So this was really um, a, a lot of how we use the qualitative work to inform both the, the intervention selection and adaptation but also importantly so that we feel like we're really getting at important changes in the quantitative work um, really informed our measurement selection. Um, so again, then we went to pilot testing the intervention um, and did one, were able to have the time to conduct one intervention group uh, and use the, the measures and look at pre and post measures with this one group and do some adaptation as we went to the, the intervention before scaling it up to, to do a um, to, 400 families, the intervention, uh, and a randomized weightless control trial. So we're, um, we've completed one phase of that in, in terms of the, uh, to about 200 families through the program and another 200 families are now going through the program and, and so we're looking at baseline data and also uh, conducting the post-intervention follow-ups. We will also conduct qualitative interviews uh, post-intervention and this is, these qualitative interviews will be focused on um, motivation for attendance, retention, um, how people viewed um, their own motivation, also thinking about who else they would, how they might change some of the things to help them better attend, um, but, but also questions in terms of the depth of change, how they experience this intervention in general, um, how um, what what per changes they perceived in their own, in themselves and in their own families, and also whether they felt some of those changes um, were maintained over time or whether it was something that they felt like changed during the sessions, but then once those sessions ended, um, you know, things went back to normal. And so this, this is trying to get at the depth uh, of some of these experiences through the intervention, uh, while the, the overall um, randomized controlled trial will look at uh, the changes over time um, in the, the sort of average changes over time in all of these families. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and happy to ask questions, um, answer other questions that come up, uh, but did want to just uh, flag up a couple of uh, other IRC mixed methods evaluations that we're doing, um, a couple on savings programs, which I know Megan will, will present on, um, and uh, some of the, most of these are uh, in the midst of, of um, the, the evaluation, um, but happy to uh, share these once they're included, uh, once they're concluded, and I should note that all of them have slightly different uh, designs in terms of how the quantitative and qualitative either speak to each other and triangulate data um, or, you know, and, and how the data is used. Um, so I will stop there. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, thanks very much. Uh, Megan, I'm going to jump straight over to you so, so we have as much time as possible at the end for questions. Okay. Oops. I'm going to try this again. Perfect. Okay. All right. So, okay, great. Thanks. Um, Good, I guess it's good, still good morning for everybody there. Um, I'm calling in from California, so it's definitely morning my time. Um, so I wanted to say, uh, just as Jeannie did, thank you for attending this session. I think it's a very interesting topic, and I'm sure that a lot of people who are logging in probably work in evaluation and have used mixed methods before, and there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've used mixed methods in a Sigma for Change program in Mali in West Africa. <clears throat> so to start off, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the organization I work for, Freedom from Hunger. 
we are a um, small organization based in Northern California. Um, as the slide shows, we bring innovative and sustainable self-help solutions to fight against chronic hunger and poverty, uh, which is often uh, which is often conveyed through technical assistance with microfinance organizations and NGOs uh, around the globe. We've been around since 1946, and we're currently reaching more than 4.4 million people across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So um, to let you know a little bit more about savings groups themselves, um, so Freedom from Hunger and um, Freedom from Hunger, Oxfam America, and the Stroma Foundation based in Norway um, created a methodology called Saving for Change. So savings groups themselves are actually a very old tradition. They're found in um, several areas of the world and in Africa, especially in West Africa, they're called uh, tontines. So the idea is that we took an older tradition and made it more democratic, a little more, more flexible, easier to use, um, and it's become a rather popular program. So we've also added education to it. So um, we specialize mainly in West Africa in health education. So for instance, um, when the groups meet together, I'll talk a little bit about a little bit more about what they do when they meet together. But when the groups meet together and they save every week, they, um, um, at least for a few weeks each year, they talk about different education topics, and um, especially in regards to malaria in West Africa. We, um, uh, currently the program is reaching over 588,000 members uh, globally. Right now with Oxfam America, we're working in um, working primarily together in Mali, but then we sort of sprouted out. And the methodology itself is also being used in El Salvador, Guatemala, Senegal, Burkina Faso, Benin, Niger, and it might be missing a country, but that's the majority of it. So how does Saving for Change work? Well, um, community organizers or uh, animators from NGOs go into communities and they help bring together 15 to 25 women to, say, to um, organize a group. There's some programs that are similar, which also include men, but our program focuses on women. The women <clears throat> elect a management committee and they decide internal rules on how they'll organize their, um, their group. They have weekly meetings where they save money. So the idea is that they all agree on a minimum amount of money and that each person saves every week for approximately a year. And throughout that year, they take the money that they've saved together and they loan it out to each other with an agreed amount of interest. So when they pay it back, the extra interest goes into the, the lockbox or the sort of pot of money that they all keep together. They keep records. In West Africa, we have an oral record keeping system. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, they receive um, education sessions. So after they've been saving for 12 months, they divide all of their money so that each member gets the amount of money that they've been saving each week over the year, but then there's also extra money that they have from the interest that they've charged each other on the loans. And so they make money off of it throughout the year. Um, they also can make money by doing other activities such as um, holding some sort of a, a raffle, for instance. We've seen groups in, um, in Ecuador and other, other savings groups programs do that. Um, dances, different activities like that. And in West Africa, we uh, also see groups that come together and they work in fields together. Uh, or like the women that are in a group will, will work for um, someone who owns a plot of land and they'll help them with harvest or help them um, you know, with other, other things. And sometimes they keep the money individually, sometimes they put it together as a group. So um, the evaluation for this program <coughs> Um, was aimed mainly at looking at the overall impact. So we, it's a very general question, just what's the impact of participation on the, um, on the members, both on it, members individually and also on their households. So we were able to put together um, a really nice evaluation program that's actually quite large. Um, so we had both a quantitative component and also a qualitative. So first, I'll start by talking about the quantitative. Um, the main component for quantitative is that we um, engaged with the research firm, or with the research NGO, I should say, uh, Innovations for Poverty Action, and we designed a randomized controlled trial. 
So the baseline was conducted in 2009 and the follow-up survey was conducted in 2012. So currently IPA is reviewing the results from the study or they're, they're analyzing it right now. So I don't have any results to, um, to discuss in this presentation, but there's quite a bit to talk about in just the methodology itself. So the study included 500 villages for control and treatment, which were 6,000 households total. Um, IPA surveyed approximately 12 women per village. The survey's um, topics included quite an array of, of uh, different areas. For instance, we asked them about income, their consumption, food security, assets, savings, lending, health, education, agricultural production, etc. So there was an emphasis on both how they use the program which included how they used other financial instruments and also sort of um, a lot of like general household topics like health, um, food consumption, food security. So we were looking both at the impact um, in general terms on the household which includes like did their income generating activities change, did their income increase, did they, um, are the um, is there any difference in how they spend money on health? For instance, are they seeking more health services now because they have access to more money? <clears throat> and then also in an operational sense, we want to know, you know, are they engaged in the program? Are they using the, this savings mechanism in addition to other savings tools? Or for instance, is it replacing other savings tools they may have used? And same thing in terms of lending. Are they using the funds from this program to borrow more money than they would otherwise or are they using it instead of borrowing money from relatives or um, other community members. We, um, and then also in terms of using the program, are the women in individually becoming more empowered? For instance, if they are meeting in these groups and they're able to have, these t have this time together each week where they can speak their mind, they um, may participate in the management committee, which puts them in a leadership role. So are they becoming stronger leaders? Are they speaking up more at home? Do they have greater decision-making power at home, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's, um, so this RCT actually had quite, in the, the surveys themselves had quite a few components. We had a, <clears throat> an adult survey plus a small household survey, a large household survey, which that complexity is very specific to West Africa and the way households are composed, plus a um, social networking survey and a census. So this randomized control trial was really quite a big, uh, quite a big undertaking. So a second component that was added to the quantitative work, again managed by Innovations for Poverty Action, are financial diaries. So we decided to take a subset of the 6,000 households, so we um, randomly selected 576 households uh, from 120 of the 500 villages, and we did two rounds of surveying. So this is a little bit confusing, but um, feel free to ask questions later. So on one hand, we took 48 households, um, excuse me, 48 villages. Uh, so select the households out of the 48 villages and survey them every two weeks for, I believe it lasted 18 months. And then for the other 76 villages, we surveyed the households every three months. And we again used similar questions from the original baseline, but um, scaled it down quite a bit. So the idea with this, um, for those who are familiar with financial diaries already, is that you we really want to take a closer look at their cash flow and how they used financial instruments. Because again, one of the main questions out of this research was to understand how are they, well, what's the impact of the program? How are they using the savings? How are they using the lending? Is it replacing or other tools they use? Is it adding to other tools they use? And also, um, I think as most people know, if you interview respondents more often, you're going to get more detail. You're going to get richer information about their lives, you're going to understand more about why they made decisions, you're going to learn about more decisions that they've made. Um, for instance, one aspect that was rather uh, 
useful with this is understanding coping mechanisms. For instance, um, what, something that would happen um, commonly is that people will save um, in the form of livestock. So they'll get, they'll get some money and they'll buy, for instance, a few more goats. Well, what happens if the goat dies? So we could take a look at, well, you know, basically they've lost an asset, so how do they react to this? Do they react to it in a short time period, a long time period? Do they buy another goat? Um, you know, what are the things they do to sort of manage the risk also and protect, protect their assets as well? <clears throat> so we got a lot of great data out of that. And um, so back to the methodology. So on one hand, we interview people every two weeks, and then there's the other group. We interviewed them every three months. So part of it was a methodological comparison. So are we getting as much information in as rich and detail from interviewing people every three months as we do every two weeks? And even though we don't have all the results to measure by, look at some, by looking at some of the preliminary analysis, um, we could tell that, yeah, we actually are getting more, more detail with the, with the surveys every two weeks. But of course, it's a much more expensive methodology and it's much, much more labor-intensive. All right, so the qualitative component um, consisted of working with another team of researchers. So we worked with a, with a group called the Bureau of Applied Research and Anthropology coming out of the University of Arizona. And we set up the timeline for the work that Barra did to be fairly close to the same time frame as IPA. They both did uh, baseline studies in 2009 and then follow-up in 2012, but of course what composed of their baseline and follow-up were different. So Barra selected 13 villages in total to interview um, members, from, well, to interview people from. Um, eight of them were new to the, pro, to the Saving for Change program, and they're also taken from the RCT zone. So again, it's like a subset of eight villages from the 500. But then five of the villages had had the program since 2005. So, this, so, the, so these villages were able to give us more insight on how they've been using the program over time. And of course, they were found, these five villages were located outside of the RCT zone. Um, and then the methodologies included um, both well, household surveys, focus group discussions, and key informant interviews, which were both with village chiefs and then also other community leaders. So basically the researchers sort of went into these villages and spent a few days in each village, just really getting to know the households that were selected, um, learning everything about their food habits, to choices about health, to um, how they use their money, where they're borrowing money from, how they're saving money, how do they, uh, where are they working, what are their income generating activities, et cetera. So they really um, did a nice um, ethnographic uh, methodology. Um, <clears throat> and again, the, the, sur but the survey topics themselves were similar to the RCT, so that was a nice point of triangulation. So of course, on one hand, you've got the quantitative work, which looked at this, which looked at these topics, and they surveyed a huge amount of people, so they had the breadth. But with the qualitative work, we got much more detail. We got the depth on the same topics. Um, and another another aspect to the qualitative work, which wasn't planned from day one, but sort of popped up later, is that within the financial diary work that IPA conducted they found that they actually wanted to have even more detail on the surveys they were collecting. So they ended up organizing with Bara to have um, Bara visit a few of the villages from the financial diaries to do additional qualitative work and just dig at, I think it was about six, seven to 10 specific topics and really, really understand how people use things. So I think um, as researchers, we all know that when you start doing research, the more research you do, the more questions pop up. You get a lot answered, but then just more come up and you want even more information. So again, this is a this was a quite a big study and we really had the luxury to get in depth. So um, this Venn diagram here just sort of reiterates how the quantitative and qualitative um, complemented one another. So the qualitative work overlapped with the randomized control trial in terms of what villages were used, but then as did the financial diaries. The financial diaries 
um, even though this Venn diagram isn't exact, but basically the, the diaries were from households out of the randomized control trial. Um, and I, I think some of it, but sorry, then the qualitative field work also overlapped with the financial diaries because Vara went in and spoke with the, um, some of those households. So it was, it was a very nice complement with one another. Um, another reason why this worked so well is not just the timeline, but also the two teams we used um, really worked well together. They're both highly respected in their fields. Um, they're both highly professional. We really enjoyed working with both of them. Um, they produced some high quality work. So why did we design it this way? Well, from the start, the team which managed the research, and I'll just emphasize here that um, this was a joint project by Oxfam America and Freedom from Hunger, and so we also managed the research together. <clears throat> so we have both our programmatic side of the, our staff and then also the research, and then those, but the programmatic and the research folks, we all work together pretty closely. So overall, both sides, programmatic and research, wanted to have the breadth of quantitative work and the depth of the qualitative work to understand the impact. So, um, and again, as I mentioned, we, we wanted to understand the context of the program, like how does this program work within West Africa, the, um, the way people use the Saving for Change program, and then also the member and the household impact. So um, we were able to ask quite a few questions. We had a very large learning agenda before we launched the program, and we've been able to use all these different methods to answer our questions. <clears throat> so the most valuable areas in terms of overlap for triangulating the, triangulating the data, well, we looked at um, a, lot of, a lot of the topics that overlapped with each other, um, but the thing in complemented each other so you could see, okay, well, you know, the quantitative data is showing that this is how the savings tools are used and also the qualitative data is explaining it even further. But one thing that became particularly useful was that the way the RCT was administered, we didn't, well, IPA had hired enumerators who were not familiar with the Saving for Change program. So it's difficult to have those enumerators really dig in, well, how did you use your savings group and what did you get out of it um, without sort of giving away that this is a, a main part of the evaluation, but with the qualitative work, they were able to get more in more depth. So um, it was really, um, it's again, it's just really interesting how you start to ask questions and it breeds more questions. And so what we didn't get out of the quantitative, we were getting out of the qualitative work. And um, as I mentioned, the times lines overlap. So um, for instance, we had, the financial diaries were administered, um, I forget the exact date, but I think they started in October of 2010, and they lasted until January of 2012. And then the base, the follow-up for the quantitative work, and um, it was launched in February, March, and lasted until May. And then after that was the qualitative follow-up, so the qualitative work by far I was able to go back and get at some of the quantitative issues as well as the financial buyers. So, okay, so what did we learn um, from using the mixed methods? So some of the things that we learned out of doing all of this um, that we would recommend to others who've done mixed method work or are interested in doing it is um, I think if you've got this many players working together, you really you want to clearly outline the rules for everyone. And it's not just a matter of what is the quantitative group do versus qualitative, but also even within the managing staff. So again, we had two, two teams working together managing the, the project, and it's just really nice to know who's, who's in charge of what, and let's be clear about it from day one. Um, you want to convey expectations for the reports that you need to all parties. For instance, um, if you work with a group of economists and you work with people who work at NGOs, you can have different expectations for baseline studies and for inlines, or baseline reports and inline studies. For instance, economists often don't do baseline reports, and sometimes they don't do baseline surveys in um, large-scale studies, but for NGOs, it's really helpful to have that baseline report, well, baseline study and report, because you want to just be able to describe who you're reaching. 
and talk about even just who's part of the study. And you want to be able to speak to both um, others in your field doing similar work and, um, and donors. Um, you want to get to know the culture and the style of the research groups that you're working with, so you just understand personal dynamics. Um, it's a, depending on the scope of your study, it can be quite large. And again, with RCTs, I think those who engage in them, they are a large, they're quite a bit of work. You really want to have the appropriate amount of resources directed to manage this. Um, but overall, you, by having that triangulation of data between both methods, you just feel a lot more confident in your results. Um, regarding resources, as I mentioned, we sort of were in a luxurious position with our donor. We had quite a bit of money to devote towards this, but you can really scale down and do smaller evaluations using both, using mixed methods. And in general, um, we found it very useful. Uh, a lot of people appreciated it. As you know, a lot of people have different takes on research. Some people value quantitative or qualitative, others vice versa, and you sort of are hitting all sides with this. So you, it, it's, it's nice that it, it shows an appreciation for all the different methods and it adds to this overall body of evidence. Um, Putin from Hunger has also used this in, um, used mix method, mixed methods in other um, evaluation work that we've done. So overall, uh, that is my presentation and I'm looking forward to questions. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Megan. And, and we do have questions ready to go. Uh, just a, a quick reminder to everyone um, that if you have a question, you can just put it in this uh, question box. So the, the first question is actually for both Jeannie and Megan. I got, got similar questions for both of you. Um, Jeannie, first for you, how did you decide that you needed an impact evaluation of the program? How did you get the funding for it? And how did you get buy-in from program staff to do an evaluation with this level of rigor? And Megan, that last question um, is kind of directed to you as well. Um, this person is asking whether you have any ideas on how to convince program managers and leaders to conduct a rigorous program evaluation despite the cost. So I'll I'll let you all answer those set of questions first before we take the next one. Sure, great, thanks. Um, we had outlined um, in the, the one of the first slides I mentioned that we were, um, IRC had prioritized, um, or I don't know if I'd mentioned this, IRC had prioritized reducing child abuse and neglect as one area of focus within our child protection teams that we wanted to um, focus on in multiple countries and had outlined as a, a learning priority that we wanted to understand the impact of family programs, family interventions uh, in general in, uh, in our types of settings, low-income settings and uh, conflict-affected communities. And so we had decided before this particular project that it was an area that we wanted to invest in for impact evaluations because the, we felt the question was important to take this learning from other contexts where there has been uh, evidence built and see whether uh, these types of family-based interventions can be adapted, whether they're feasible, um, effective, cost-effective in, in the types of settings that we work in and the families that we work for. Um, and so that we decided uh, a priori that that was a question important to us. And then um, both to the first and the second question, then an opportunity came up. There was a an RFA um, through for USAID funding. Um, I don't remember what exactly the limits of that were, but but within that scope, certainly there were um, the outcomes lined up with these outcomes around reducing child abuse and neglect. And so we proposed within the proposal both to do the programming and then to carve out um, some evaluation funding as as we would for regular monitoring and evaluation. But we um, carved out uh, more funding for rigorous a rigorous evaluation. We've then added a little bit of supplemental funding to that from a various uh, from various sources, but the the bulk of that has really been uh, the the funding that was carved out from that program 
uh, from that proposal. Um, and then buy-in uh, from program staff, we, um, there, there's good buy-in in our, uh, from the country program that this was a question that they felt was important, that they were invested in uh, conducting a rigorous evaluation. So it was in discussion with the, the country program team that was there. Um, and then it was really a, um, a, a good team effort, I would say, um, in terms of trying to set up, get the right uh, research and evaluation coordinator there, and, and there's been a lot of good partnership with the country program, our headquarters here, and then our research, um, our, our research partner, although um, I, I think I would say a lot of the lessons we've learned are similar to what Megan stated, and one of them is defining those roles um, very carefully, and also being clear with, I think we've learned through a lot of our, our impact evaluations, um, to be clearer with country programs and, and field staff um, who will be, program staff who will be delivering the program and a part of the evaluation, what the expectations are and what some of the burden, as well as, um, you know, some of the benefit will be. Uh, so I think we've gotten better at communicating that now. Great. Thanks, Jeannie. Megan, do you want to take um, the similar question? Sure. Um, so regarding the um, ideas on how to convince program managers and leaders to conduct it despite the cost, well, first of all, with evaluation, I find that you're much more successful if you've got management buy-in, but then if you know, how do you even get that? And I think what you really have to try to do is put together a nice, ar nice argument on what are the benefits of engaging in a large-scale study. Um, sometimes it's a matter of getting recognition in the field, so more uh, organizations know your organization, know your programs, and know that you do nice research. Another aspect of it is publication. Do you want to say that you've been able, you've published in specific journals, etc.? But you really, but I mean, what it really comes down to is how much is your organization benefiting from knowing this new knowledge? And um, there's, if you talk to certain people, uh, for instance, um, I'm going to reference IPA again because we've done a lot of work with them, but um, Dean Carlin from Hans IPA has a really nice argument about it, and so do a lot of researchers in other universities, is that do you want to be, um, do you want to be doing a program because you want to do a, want to be doing that program, or do you want to do a program because you're doing the right program that gives you positive and effective results? Most people, of course, really want the latter, but it's a difficult um, sort of pill to swallow if you've been doing a program that isn't terribly effective. And a lot of people are threatened by evaluation. So another aspect of it is um, if it's even possible to create sort of a safe culture around discussing evaluation within your organization, I mean, maybe you've already got it or maybe it's something you, you need to foster further, but if you put a lot of emphasis on, well, evaluation is a way that we can learn from what we're already doing. We know we're already doing a good job, but don't you want to do an even better job? You know, we've been, we, everybody spends so much time working on all of these programs. Don't we want to do something which is effective? And I think most people would agree with that. Another, another thing that I find that gets um, people involved in evaluation in general is if you um, honestly um, ask for their input and put it into the evaluation itself. So if you have like a brainstorming session and you get people to think about, well, if we did an evaluation, what research questions would you want asked? What are the aspects of the program you want to learn more about? And make sure to include that in the design of the evaluation, then it just gets people it gets people more interested and caring more about what you're doing. Also, regarding the cost, um, it just helps if you've got a donor who you've been talking to who's willing to give you the money to do this. So that's, um, that's of course, much more tricky than, um, <laughs> than I've just presented it there. But I think all of those add to sort of this culture of um, valuing evaluation in general and um, trying to do what you can to get the most out of the results. Before moving on to the next question, actually, that's up on the screen, um, as you spoke, we got a couple of, of questions that I th think, again, pertain to, to both of you. Um, and it's whether, whether you can seriously considered any alternative methods for obtaining a relevant counterfactual perspective rather than an RCT, given the cost. Um, this person is... Uh, 
pointing to, to what is known maybe about other savings and loans programs like historic Tantines or TONS in, in Mali, and sorry if I'm pronouncing those incorrectly. Um, so any, any comments to, from either of you in, in that regard, especially, Megan, since at the end of your presentation you mentioned that it is possible to do some of this at a lower cost and that this was kind of a luxury uh, study. Uh, sure, I'll speak to that for um, a minute or two and hand it to Jeannie. Um, so I think, well, honestly, like we're, Freedom of Hunger, it, when we have the opportunity to engage in a randomized controlled trial, we will because it's not a common um, scenario. So, but we do quite a bit of evaluation that does not include randomized controlled trials. And so um, when we look at counterfactuals, for instance, in a quasi-experimental design. Um, for instance, one, scenario, uh, one example that we've been, um, for a study we've been doing recently is that we looked at um, villages within a community that received the program and then similar villages in outlying communities um, that aren't receiving the program. So it's, we had, so we created the control group versus the treatment group um, comparison within the study but um, it's not, they weren't randomized, it's not large scale, and there is an intention, um, there's an intention to roll out the program to these other communities afterwards if we can. Actually that, I didn't mention that, but that is part of the RCT design, is that there's been full intention to roll out the, the treatment to the control villages after the study was finished, and so we have to find an appropriate way to do that. But there's, um, we, I mean, as I said, we do quite a bit of evaluation that are not RCTs. I, we just, this happened to be a larger scale situation um, that was a nice one to talk about, but there's, there's other ways to find comparable communities um, based on certain factors such as socioeconomic status, do they have exposure to similar programs, et cetera, that are in small communities. Um, so there's other ways to get around this. So uh, Jeannie, go ahead if you want to comment on that. Sure. So um, I guess the first point I would make is, is we um, certainly only focus on doing rigorous um, impact evaluations where there isn't previous evidence of whether a project is uh, or a particular intervention has worked or not. So where there are large bodies of evidence supporting um, that an, an intervention brings certain outcomes, uh, we feel comfortable. Um, conducting monitoring uh, or conducting pre and post designs. Um, what we try to do is outline what are the questions that are most important for us and we think then for, for others uh, in the, the humanitarian development fields and where answering those questions in a more rigorous way uh, would uh, contribute to the body of evidence and, and learning uh, around particular interventions and outcomes. Um, so, uh, and, and then of course with each um, opportunity that comes up to answer a question, we look at whether it's feasible or ethical, well, let me say first, we, we sort of look at what best method we would want to use um, given the question and then given feasibility and, and the ethical considerations. Um, so we are conducting quite a few uh, RCTs. We almost always conduct waitlist uh, controlled studies where we're phasing in um, our, uh, the, the participants in a randomized way, so we're not denying treatment, but rather um, phasing people in. Um, affecting people or communities in, um, but we, we certainly also look at uh, quasi-experimental uh, methods and as, as Megan noted, do other types of, of evaluations, um, looking at uh, potentially other comparison groups, or, or as I said, when we're, um, when there's a, a strong body of evidence just doing pre and post and looking at, at change and then trying to have good monitoring and sometimes qualitative work that um, looks at attributing that change. Great. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, the next set of questions are directed at one of you uh, specifically, so I, I've kind of mixed them up, but Jeannie, the next question is for you, and it's um, just, again, mixed methods. It's a, a mix of qualitative and quantitative methods, and this person was interested in hearing a little bit more about the quantitative components of, of the evaluation, so if you could say something briefly about that. 
Sure, and I um, my emphasis on the qualitative, I guess, was for two reasons. One, to show how it fed into the, the quantitative um, as a piece of the mixed methods and, and how we did that, um, and, and also because that's uh, the place where you have the most findings, and we don't have findings, unfortunately, to report on the, the quantitative. But in terms of the the quantitative methods, um, it is it was a randomized weightless control where um, 200 half of the 400 around half of the 400 families were randomized um, first into uh, the intervention and half were were on the waitlist to be uh, rolled out later um, and so we're our con that was our control group uh, we conducted a baseline. Uh, survey first uh, before the intervention and that included measures as I mentioned that were um, came out at least in part from our qualitative work included measures uh, on uh, parental discipline and behavior including their physical punishment positive discipline um, but and and also these created measures of family functioning how, how well a family was uh, communicating together, how they were problem solving, um, child behavior, um, so both internalizing, what are called internalizing symptoms of uh, that look like sort of depression or, or anxiety symptoms, but also external um, conduct uh, behaviors that are showing children acting out um, as a result of issues that they're facing and social problems. Um, we also measured child resilience, which was created um, from the qualitative data, and then measured the um, some substance use in parents. And so the same survey uh, was conducted at baseline, and that part of the the post-intervention uh, survey has already been conducted using the same measures, um, and then six months post um, the, after the end of the intervention, we will also uh, conduct another survey with the same measures to look at change um, at two time points, both right after the intervention and then uh, the six-month follow-up. Um, and again, that's, as I mentioned, uh, concurrent with qualitative interviews that are looking more in depth at the experience families, uh, parents and children had uh, during the intervention and also after the intervention in their um, families and, and some in their communities and um, looking at how then that matches up with the, the quantitative methods. Great. Um, Megan, the next two questions are for you. Uh, the first is, if you can say a little bit more about how um, IPA measured empower, empowerment for the Savings for Change RCT, um, and, and someone, another person wrote in also asking about this, asking more specifically what factors did you look at and whether you used qualitative and quantitative methods or, or both to measure changes in empowerment. And then the second question, <laughs> sorry, just to give you both of them at once, um, is how you address the risk of the content included in the financial diaries being altered right before the visit of the IPA enumerators or researchers? How far in advance was the start of the evaluation announced to the women's groups? OK, great, thanks. So. Um, <clears throat> A lot of the indicators that were put together for the, the surveys were pulled from uh, World Bank surveys um, and also some other surveys that IPA had used in different evaluations. Um, so the empower <clears throat> empowerment indicators looked a lot at the decision making, their roles in the households, their perceptions on um, how they view um, their roles in communities, um, leadership positions that they took within community associations, <clears throat> uh, self-esteem. Uh, sometimes it included uh, questions on you know, whether statements they agreed with or did not agree with. Uh, so it's a, there were definitely an empowerment sections to the survey, um, and also I believe that part of the social capital question sort of added to the empowerment mix. Um, so those, that's where they came. There's, um, again, it's a really it's a large survey, so there's definitely questions that were not coming directly to mind, but if um, anyone was interested and wanted to have more detail on that, I could pull some, pull some exact indicators for you. Um, and then we did use, we used it both in the, I think the empowerment indicators are more used in the quantitative than in the qualitative. Um, 
but again, like some of the, the, the two firms both had access to each other's surveys, so I think they were able to copy some of the same questions and also come up with ones that um, complemented each other. So regarding the second question, um, well, part of this was the way the data was collected. So IPA for the financial diaries, um, not for the baseline, but for the financial diaries and for the follow-up, they used um, computer tablets to collect the data. So basically, um, I think they used Blaze software and um, for like all the back-end programming work, and they put the surveys, um, you know, it adds programs into computers. So the surveyors, the enumerators themselves, could enter data, but they couldn't modify questions. So um, they basically had to carry the computers with them to the communities and read off the questions from the screen and enter the data um, as it came along. And then there was a whole system of back checks that were done, I think, once a month, where a supervisor would randomly select a household, take that survey with the answers on it, go back and, at, and randomly select a few questions and ask them to make sure that the surveyors were asking the questions correctly. So there wasn't much of a risk on um, altering the content. And then how far in advance was the start of the evaluation announced to the women's groups? I think it was just a few months in advance. We didn't want to make a big issue out of it because we didn't want to draw extra attention to it than it was necessary. Um, so it was just something that the animators um, mentioned to, well, the animators in the groups didn't talk about it much. It was more of the survey firm tried to keep themselves separate from the program um, and also we tried to not talk about the evaluation much in the program themselves. I think it was mentioned a little bit but it was more so that the evaluators went into the communities and just met with households. So then there wasn't a connection, um, there wasn't a strong connection between the evaluation and the program. Because, people, because once you know that then people can alter their answers. Jeannie, the next questions are for you. Um, how can you, how did you ensure that the control group of children aren't receiving any kind of services? Um, and then a second question is whether all the questions in the survey design focused on the person being interviewed or whether there were also questions from other perspectives that could be used to validate and triangulate the responses, um, kind of speaking about what others do, uh, which might be a little difficult in a family environment. Yeah, great, great questions. Um, so the, the first, um, I, I'm sure that some of the, well, I'm not sure, but um, the, it may be that some of the control group, um, as well as some of the treatment group, are receiving some other kinds of services. In fact, we hope that they they are receiving some of the services. Um, the, and, and that should balance itself out. That's one of the reasons to um, do a randomized trial is um, that the, the idea is hopefully, um, or on balance uh, w with randomization, that those who are in the, the treatment group uh, are receiving around the same amount of services as those in the control group. And so the, the difference, uh, again, on average between the treatment and control is only uh, the intervention that you're, you're giving them. Um, where we have to be careful when doing this as an implementing organization is um, sometimes when you're randomizing by community and, and so you start in a certain, let's say, 10 communities or, or 100 communities, uh, and you're going to roll out to the next hundred uh, later, then um, what can happen is that, um, you know, especially with an, an NGO that does intervenes in multiple sectors, is say, oh, we're already starting to work in those communities, and so let's add on several other interventions within the intervention or treatment uh, control communities or to the people who are receiving the treatment. And then it becomes unbalanced in a very um, systematic way where um, the treatment or control are, are receiving um, other kinds of services because they're the treatment or control group. But, but on balance, the randomization should, um, should balance that out. In terms of um, all the questions, great question about self-report um, because they're certainly um, difficult to to question and, and also, um, uh, or sorry, to answer from families and also you have the, um, the potential threat of um, 
those who go through a program where there's some discussion about communication or discipline answering in a certain way uh, in order to, you know, to, to sort of give back answers that they know uh, you want to hear, the researchers want to hear. Um, so what we, what helps with this, um, this me our method in terms of answering is that there's both, there are both child and parent interviews. Um, not all of the, and I have to look at this again, but not all of the questions are asked in the same way, and we certainly um, looked at appropriateness of questions for the, the children that we're attending, but we do ask both um, in, in a number of our evaluations with parents and children, we, we ask, ask both children and parents um, and then look at, at how the findings are matching up between parents and, and children. And so that gives us some triangulation of the, the changes within families. I don't think there were in the qualitative interviews some questions a lot about um, norms within the community about discipline and that really helped us. Um, you know, we weren't asking people about risk and protective factors or, or why their family is uh, a good family or, or having difficulties. We were asking more generally about the community, but I believe um, in this survey uh, our focus, uh, uh, certainly uh, the majority of focus, and I think almost all questions are asking about specific changes um, to both parents and children. Great. Thanks very much. Um, Megan, we'll, make, we'll have to make this the last question. Um, because our time is coming to an end, but uh, the beneficiaries or clients were were interviewed quite frequently, um, and and it seems that the set of questions they were asked was quite extensive. Was any incentive provided to respondents, and do you have any data available on the response rate? Sure. Um, so with the, um, especially with the financial diaries, um, because we were visiting households so often, we provided a gift for them every other survey, so once a month instead of every two weeks, for instance. Um, but the gift was quite small. So um, IPA purchased gifts that were in value of approximately 300 SAFA, which is about 75 US cents, and it was usually household items like soap or sugar, um, tea. Uh, after a while, though, it became clear that the men wanted the gifts to also pertain to them, So, because um, we interviewed both male and female um, household members, um, but since the gifts were really oriented towards the household, we saw that towards the end it would, we had a little bit, had a little more interest from the male if we included tea instead of just sugar and you know, flour, or not <laughs> flour, but um, other items specifically for cooking. Um, so regarding data on the response rate, um, well, in terms of who, uh, like attrition for response rate, in terms of how many people dropped out, surprisingly, very, very, very few people dropped out. A lot of people were interested in talking to outsiders that were coming in and asking all of these questions about their, their lives. Um, the enumerators got to sort of know the clients over time. And I wouldn't say they built friendships, but they definitely um, grew in familiarity with one another. And um, on top of all that, something that's come out of financial diaries methodology is that there's, um, there's a certain amount that people learn from talking about their money so frequently they start to learn more about how they manage their money, they pay more attention to it, and people feel like they get something out of it. So as to whether how much, you know, does this affect the data, it's a good question. I haven't seen a lot of information, uh, or I haven't, I haven't seen a study that really looks at that Hawthorne effect, but um, so far we're not terribly concerned about um, getting, like, incorrect data because of it. So, in fact, I think we just got richer data. Great. Well, Jeannie, Megan, thank you both very much again for your presentations and for your, your answers to all these questions. Um, I, like I said, that is the, all the time we have for questions, but just in, in terms of wrap up, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, all the materials from this webinar as well as the other guidance notes in the series will be available at the link you see at the bottom of your screen. And we'll also be posting the translations here as they're ready, so watch for those as well. Um, in terms of next steps, if you have questions for the panelists, um, their, their email addresses are up on the screen. Um, after this, this webinar ends, you'll receive an email with a link to a short survey. Um, and so 
please do take a few moments to complete that. We'd really appreciate your feedback on today's webinar and on the series. And, and finally, our last guidance note on use of impact evaluation results is currently being finalized. Once it's ready, I'll make sure that everyone that has participated in these webinars to date receives information on that note's release and the accompanying webinars. So thanks very much again to everyone for their participation, and please do go to the, to the webpage with information on the series to, to find all the relevant materials. Thanks very much.